welcome to Biocom's weekly How Do You Even podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by higher rates journalist, economist and Times correspondent Angel Pfeffer, also author of the latest biography of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We're going to be talking about the latest developments on the election campaign, how the different candidates are shaping up, what they're saying about each other. But before we do that, we really want to discuss the latest incidents, the latest phase in this ongoing conflict between Israel and Iran in Syria. Just this week, we've seen a situation where there were Israeli strikes during daytime on sites in Syria. It seemed like in response, Iran fired medium-range missiles at the uh, Hermon Mountains and the Golan Heights. And then there was a very large-scale retaliation by Israel hitting uh, Syrian air defense systems and numerous Iranian positions in Syria. There was a great deal of openness about this from the Israel Defense Forces using their social media channels and to publicize what they're doing while they were launching the retaliation to actually specifically say they were targeting the Quds Force, Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps. And also we saw quite open statements from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for which he was criticised by Israeli opposition politicians for removing sort of level of deniability. So first of all, Anshul, I wanted to ask, does this take us into a new phase in this conflict? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's not new. I mean, Iran used missiles against Israel in May, May 2018. And uh, after that, there was another series of Israeli airstrikes, which was actually larger than the one we saw this week. So, uh, operationally speak, uh, speaking, this is not, not a precedent. This has happened before. Uh, what, we, what we are seeing now is we're seeing it being spoken about more openly by, by the Prime Minister, by, by the IDF. We saw on Sunday, on Sunday night that uh, the IDF actually announced in real time that we are right now attacking uh, Iranian targets in Syria. And this was... A warning to to the Syrian air to the Syrian air defense not to fire missiles against Israeli planes. Obviously, it didn't the warning <laughs> wasn't heeded, and the Syrians did fire. And Israel also attacked in retaliation a number of Syrian air, air defense batteries. So it's not entirely new, but it is an escalation because it's happening more openly, it's happening more frequently, and uh, what we're seeing also is a new phase of this ongoing war between Israel and Iran on Syrian soil in which Israel now claims to have prevented Iran from establishing uh, permanent bases and now it's acting to uh, stop Iran from supplying Hezbollah and other proxies with more accurate missiles. And do you think those those claims hold up? I mean, has there actually been a Has there actually been a situation where Iran has been prevented? Because it seems like there's an ongoing situation where Iran is trying to bring in supplies. It's sort of setting up bases, Israel destroys them, and we're just sort of going around in a cycle. Well, a couple of years ago, Israel was warning that uh, Iran's next step in the in the region, so in Syria, is to build serious permanent bases to have a, an Iranian wing at every Syrian air force base to have a port and various other installations and that doesn't seem to have happened the, si- the the scale of the Iranian presence and the Iranian proxies presence is not the scale that Israel warned would happen so if you know if we're to believe what we're being told by the IDF in the last couple of weeks there has been a certain degree of success in, in reigning in Iran and preventing major bases being built in Syria and so on, if that, if that indeed was the Iranian plan. But what we are seeing as well is that Iran's not giving up and they're still carrying on with their efforts to bring in more material and more know-how and to enhance the capabilities of their proxies, both in Syria and Lebanon. Yeah. Just to talk about the sort of the IDF position, and there's been, there's been a lot written about this, and there's been a lot of claims of politicisation. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. There seems to be a pattern that where there is a major escalation, or whether, and I'm thinking of last February, last May, and this incident, that all seem to involve when Iran either sent a drone, like in February 2018, or fired grad missiles at the Golan in May 2018, or in this instance, fired what were described as medium-range missiles at the Hermon. 
in response to that, the IDF is extremely open about Iranian involvement and about the targets it's trying to hit. And there seems to be a pattern there that as soon as that happened, that they massively upscale their identification of Iran as the enemy and, and sort of also increase the kind of psychological war on social media. Do you think that this was part of that pattern now, or do you think the IDF has really upscaled that kind of social media noise, and, and why? I, I'd say yes to both questions, because it is in a similar pattern to what we saw in February following the drone, and in May following the, the, the attack on the Golan. So you know, in both those cases, as you said, Israel did acknowledge immediately that it, that it was retaliating against Iran. And in many other cases over the last two years, when Israel attacked Iranian targets in Syria, it didn't acknowledge it at the time. It only acknowledged it much later. So that is the pattern. But we are seeing a scaling up of the, you know, of the attention Israel's, uh, that Israel is trying to draw to this, both internationally and in the media, and in explaining this to the Israeli public as well. And I think that's partly to do with the uh, developments in Washington. I think that Israel wants to make it clear to the, to the Trump administration that the, that the war in Syria is by no means over, and hopefully, from Israel's point of view, to perhaps postpone the withdrawal of, uh, of American troops from Syria, or at least keep some of them in strategic areas where they are obstructing Iran's uh, ground corridor from Iran through Iraq, Syria, and all the way to Lebanon, there are, especially in TANF, where there's a, a American contingent, that, that, that is something Israel would like to see remaining for the time being. So drawing the attention to what's happening in, in Syria certainly serves that purpose. Yeah, that's very interesting. Let, let's pivot slightly to the election and, and, and just sort of, I think we can reflect that, as I think we've discussed before, any of these kinds of instances all, all are seen through the prism also of the election campaign. I thought it was interesting that a lot of the opposition politicians uh, blamed Prime Minister Netanyahu for being so open about attacking Iranian targets after Russia said that Israel needs to stop these airstrikes and was quite quite open about that yesterday in Moscow. And they sort of blamed Prime Minister Netanyahu and said, you've, you've removed our deniability and that then affects the whole equation. But I think that's probably a symbol, and I get your thoughts on this, of like how the election campaign maybe sort of this week has sort of burst into life a little bit more. Um, I think, you know, we've seen Benny Gantz finally admitting that he's going to give a speech next week. Uh, we've seen some terrible campaign ads, some good campaign ads. We've seen Naftali Bennett now is openly attacking Gantz and his military record. I just wanted to get your thoughts on sort of the strategy that seems to have gone into a bit of overdrive from Bennett attacking Gantz and what you think we might hear from Benny Gantz next week. Let me just answer the first bit of your question and the, the accusations by various opposition figures that Netanyahu somehow failed in Syria. I think the first thing, uh, one important thing is that Russia, when they're saying this week that it's unacceptable for Israel to attack, it, it's just rhetoric because we've seen that Russia is not prepared on the ground to do very much to, to protect its, uh, its client regime as that. As long as, as, long as it, the Israeli attacks are not actually jeopardizing Assad's regime, they're only... Uh, they're only they're, the only regime comp component that they're attacking is, is air defense when they, they're firing in Israel. But all, but all the rest of the time, Israel's attacking Hezbollah or Iran. Russia doesn't seem to be doing very much to stop it. And uh, whatever they, whatever they, the the foreign ministry spokesperson in Moscow may have said was uh, seems to be for, for political use and not and not to have any real effect on the ground. And that. I think uh, sort of cancels out what some opposition figures have sort of been saying. I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm very critical of Netanyahu in many things. I don't think that he's failed in Syria so far. He may not have been as successful as uh, as he wants to make it seem, but by and large, the Israeli strategy is, is still working in Syria, and we have, and I have, I have yet to see any real sign of the Russians trying to block Israel from from carrying out attacks in, in Syria, whatever they've said over the, over the past few months. And Netanyahu, for all his faults, is not the person to launch military attacks just to boost his, uh, his popularity rating. That's, that's, he's too risk averse. And the, the Israeli military has its own ways of saying to the Israeli public if it's being told to do things it doesn't want to do. We've seen it in the past. And I think if there was, if there was an order to the Israeli military to carry out 
a strike that the military thought was politically motivated and didn't have a strategic or tactical justification. The, the IDF has, has its ways to let those objections known, and we haven't heard that. As, as far as uh, Gantz and Bennett and various other party leaders uh, attacking each other, it's, it's election season, and Gantz's biggest asset is his, is his military background. Currently, it's his only asset. It's a massive asset because he's a chief of staff, and he's seen by many Israelis as a trustworthy security figure. So it's pretty natural for people like Bennett and uh, Yoav Gallant, who's just joined uh, Likud, and other Likud figures to try and attack him on that front. Where else would they attack Gantz? Yeah. What do you think he might say next week? Would he say anything of substance? I've been speaking to some of Gantz's campaign people and people close to him. Sadly, he's he's not talking. But it seems that he's running a very disciplined campaign. Gantz, also as, as an officer and as a general, he was always very much a team player, not the kind of general who makes a decision and tells everyone, to shut up, he will always listen to uh, to experts and to colleagues. And so far, we're seeing him run a very disciplined campaign. He's kept quiet for months. Over the last week or so, we've had five uh, campaign videos, which are obviously very carefully scripted by campaign experts. So he's you know he's letting the professionals run the show. On the basis of that, we can assume that whatever he'll say on Tuesday will, will be carefully scripted. So maybe they'll uh, make the opposite decision and think that he should come over authentic and unscripted. I, I don't know what we're going to see on Tuesday, but it'll certainly be very well planned. The Gantz campaign feel that they have a, a one-off opportunity to challenge Netanyahu. The polls, the, the head-to-head polls between, between Netanyahu and Gantz are showing relatively small margins. We haven't seen this kind of polling probably in a decade of anyone coming so close to Netanyahu in the, in the, in the suitability as prime minister question. The, the, the party... Hossan is doing okay, but it's not, no, it's not threatening Likud yet. It's, it's getting 14 seats in the polls. Likud is still close to 30. So they still have to translate Gantz's uh, popularity into seats, and that's the next stage of their, of their campaign. But the fact that they have a candidate who is challenging Netanyahu on the main issue, on the security issue, which is the main issue the Israelis care about at the end of the day when they go to vote, is... I'd almost say a unique opportunity, and, and they're trying to handle it very carefully, that, that window of opportunity that they feel that they have. Well, I suppose the sign that they're really breaking through is going to be whether his party starts to poll in the high teens or above. Well, we're, you know, you know, we're looking now at, at three or four parties, perhaps even more, which all together, you know, who, who are occupying the centre ground. So, so, so we've got Gantt's new Hossam Israel party, Israel Resilience, rather awkward name. We've got uh, Yair Lapid's Yeshatid, and we've got Labour. And, you know, you can add on Oli Levy's uh, Gesher and, and Kulanu, perhaps Sipi Livni, if she crosses the threshold. We've got a block here of over 40 seats in the polls. Now, Gantz is sort of level pegging now with Yeshatid at, at around 14. But if those uh, voters of, of the other parties start to see Gantz as the most viable candidate, we'll probably see over the next few days and weeks votes going from those parties to Hossein and perhaps pushing it to, towards 20 or even above. And that will be, if, if we see that, that will be the tide turning for Gantz. Some of those parties will have no choice but to join Hossein in some way in a joint list. And the key thing that we, we've yet to see are votes wandering from the right-wing coalition, perhaps a soft margin of the right, towards a centrist party. And that's, that, that's what we have to look out for. Until we see a couple of seats moving from Likud to Gantz, I still can't predict a, 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 an upset in this election. But Gantz is beginning to open up a, a window of opportunity for himself. And it, it's going to be a fascinating next few weeks when we see how, what are the trends in the polls. Yeah. Just a final thought. I mean, the big the big um, moment for this election, still expected the Attorney General at some point in the next few weeks, certainly before February the 21st, to make his decision about an indictment of Netanyahu. Is that, would you agree with that? And what's your thoughts on what he might say? Well, you know, what we're hearing from senior sources in the Justice Ministry is that 
Mendelblit is going to announce his decision sometime in February. And it seems like he will endorse at least part of the recommendations of police to indict Netanyahu on bribery and fraud in one or two, or, or maybe perhaps all three of the cases which the police have recommended he, he be indicted in. Now, we don't really know what's going to happen on the day after that announcement. The accepted idea is that Likud and slash Netanyahu have around the quarter of the vote, around 30 seats. But there was a very interesting poll early this, earlier this week, uh, which was uh, commissioned by uh, IDF Radio, which, which asked people, what would you vote assuming the Attorney General announces indictments? And that shows four or five seats leaving Likud and moving to centrist parties. Now, that's a hyper, still a hypothetical question. We, we, we have yet to see what Mandelblit says and, and, and in, as a result of that, what kind of shift. But that will certainly be, I'd say, the, a pivotal moment in, the, in this campaign. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we will wait and see. Well, um, Angel Pfeffer, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you for listening.